Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Shi Chao Li. Uh, I'm the current faculty of the hist uh, Department of Architectural History at the UVA, as, or as Richard affectionately calls it, the joint. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a joint. And I'm absolutely privileged to be part of this, and I just want to take this opportunity to welcome everyone on behalf of the uh, faculty members uh, and, and the chair uh, to another day uh, of this amazing conference. And, and, and I often judge the success of conference based on how many people show up for the second day. <laughs> <laughs> and by the look of it, this success is uh, beyond measure. I, um, I don't know how to put the framework around it. Um, I um, uh, want to thank Margaret and the organization team for putting this amazing uh, conference together. And yesterday, it was like architectural history in live action. And it was really uh, quite an incredible set of presentations. Uh, I learned a huge amount, and uh, this is certainly uh, amazing uh, bonding moment and it's institutional uh, it's, um, a building moment for, for us. Um, I want to um, thank all of you to be historians, to be architectural historians. I think this is really important. Uh, I always think that people turn to history when you have a social, moral, political crisis and that's what happened in 1960s late 1960s with uh, uh, the world events being <coughs> uh, uh, challenging. And today we seem to have the same moment and I think uh, uh, the job commitment and work to safeguard facts, not alternative facts, but facts, uh, to be willing to discuss um, different narratives of history as we witnessed yesterday and to commit to promoting history as a public intellectual project. Uh, they are all incredibly important for today, and uh, this is not just for UVA, for Virginia, not even just for United States, but actually for the world, and, and this is um, what I see it as a world institution, and this, if, um, if it has already, uh, if it's not, in that status, and it's certainly our job to uh, make it a world institution. Um, I also want to thank Mr. Jefferson, uh, who cannot be with us today, <laughs> for some important reasons, for framing architecture in the right way, as a way to make better, more just society. Uh, I think um, uh, this is, uh, a great project to get involved in, and I want to thank, of course, finally, RGW for putting all this to practice. It's building up this institution. It's not built in one day, but over 40 years. And certainly the school, the history program has uh, uh, been, uh, uh, has benefited greatly from Richard's contribution, and I'm absolutely thrilled that we're all here to celebrate that achievement, and and uh, 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 at the same time to celebrate the importance of history and the importance of historical facts um, and interpretations. Um, so, without further ado, I think uh, I want to say this. Thank you to all of you, and I would like to uh, hand over the chair of the first session, Travis McDonald, the man behind the spectacular restoration of Poplar Forest, and among other achievements, Travis.
That's quite all right. Well, um, good morning. Um, it was wonderful to see so many of you at Three Notched Brewery last night, enjoying the good food, the good drink, and the great UVA fellowship. Um, my name is Paula Moore, and I first met Richard in 1987 when I attended the Victorian Society Summer School in Newport. And then I came to Virginia in 2000 to start the PhD program and was very fortunate to have Richard as my dissertation director. Um, so we had uh, a wonderful uh, thought-provoking papers uh, yesterday, and uh, today we have more uh, to enjoy. Um, so you're in for a real treat. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the chair of our first session, um, who many of you know, um, Travis McDonald. Uh, Travis received his master's in architectural history in 1980 and for the past 30 years has uh, directed the painstaking restoration of Jefferson's poplar forest. So please help me welcome Travis McDonald. Good morning. I couldn't resist the opportunity to say a few words about Richard. Uh, and if I can do this down at the bottom. Okay, we can have the lights now. From the beginning. There we go. <laughs> Standing tall. So, a lot of you know Richard started here in the fall of 1976. He was a young professor who wore wild straight ties. <laughs> he and Ellie lived in a modest house with a few reproduction prints on the wall, certainly not what you see in his house today. They had one small child and another quickly on the way. So my class that entered in the fall of 1977 was actually the first class that Richard helped select. Richard also sported wonderful sideburns at the time, <laughs> which were as common as bell-bottom trousers. He had just published one of his earliest article, articles, and he had one modest book under his belt. My class did not like the current chairman of the architectural history department, and we had the nerve to sign a petition to Dean Joe Bosserman, who, to his great credit, installed young Richard on the throne. <laughs> uh, our class was the first to claim our, our guy. Uh, Richard was teaching some very exciting new courses, like the American Renaissance, and invited our whole class up to the Brooklyn Museum to the opening of that seminal exhibition, and later to the opening at the one at the Smithsonian. He took us to see American Renaissance buildings in Philadelphia, where we feared for our lives in a flea bag hotel. But that was probably not as bad as the, the, the Philadelphia field trip led by Freddie Nichols, where we slept on the floor of the Cliveden barn. <laughs> Richard went on to do another blockbuster exhibition that you all know about. And we traveled with him up to New York to see modernism. About this time, the more mature Richard took on a new fashionable appearance and started cranking out the articles and books that we all know him for. From my own bookshelf, we can see a few examples. And I hope everybody knows these works. And occasionally, we caught up with Richard in other countries. Here he is prowling Bath, England. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention his other enduring fashionable legacy, the bow tie. Okay, that's all for memory lane. <laughs> I can do this. 
Okay. Our first speaker is Nanette Arroyo. She is a PhD candidate in art and architectural history here at UVA. Her dissertation investigates the creation of religious sacred space in the Spanish California missions through interplay of the built environment, material culture, and spatial practice. She situates this period in American history within a global tradition of creating sacred spaces as sites of constructed meanings and negotiated identities. Nanette received the 2018 dissertation fellowship from the Academy of the American Francis Franciscan History. And at UVA, her research has been supported by the America Center, the Institute of the Humanities and Global Cultures, and the Center for Global Inquiry and Innovation. Please welcome Nanette. Good morning. I'm delighted to be here, but I must admit that I felt it might be a little strange to start off today's sessions here at UVA, the standard bearer of a signature American architecture, with a presentation devoted to California architecture. But then I remind myself that Richard Guy Wilson was born and raised in California and has confessed yesterday to having an early admiration for Spanish colonial architecture, <laughs> much to the dismay of his modernist parents. <laughs> Richard also likes to point out that the city of San Francisco was established on June 29, 1776, six days before the Declaration of Independence, which was somewhere else. So this is probably not a bad place to start after all. The California missions established by Franciscan friars between 1769 and 1823 were conceived as centers for the religious conversion of indigenous peoples and as self-sustaining agricultural enterprises to develop regional economies. The images I will present date from the late 18th to the mid 19th century prior to the period of structural ruin which began in the latter years of Mexican California and accelerated after US statehood in 1850. In almost all of the illustrations, the focal point is the Mission Church, which was the most architecturally sophisticated building in the complex. This morning, however, I will redirect attention towards the rancherias, which were the dwellings of the mission's indigenous community. The presence of these secondary structures in the drawings and paintings made by artists ranging from the professional to the amateur challenges us to consider not just what they visually represent, but also what they do not show. This late 18th century map presents the territorial scope commanded by Spain in the late 18th century, illustrating its transoceanic reach across the Pacific to the Philippines and the Atlantic to the Americas. Upper California, or Alta California as it was called then, was accessible only through hazardous sea or hostile land routes. It was not settled until the late 18th century in reaction to Russian and English incursions into the Pacific Northwest. On the left is a present day snapshot from Google Maps that identifies the chain of missions strewn from north to south. On the right is an ethnographic map of California drawn by Alfred Krober, pioneering anthropologist of Native American culture. The colors on the larger map uh, delineate the tribal communities in pre-Spanish California, while in the smaller one, they signify the major linguistic groups. I put it up here because it's interesting to note that representations of space, just like architectural representations, can promote narratives, consciously or unconsciously. Krober's map reveals a diversity and complexity that is lost in the Google map view. To secure her territorial interests, Spain established four presidios, or military forts, close to well-situated harbors. San Diego was in the territory of the Kumeaii people. Monterey 
and San Francisco were mostly occupied by tribalists collectively known as the Ohlone. Santa Barbara was the domain of the Chumash, a people whose superior wood, stone, and basket craft impressed the Spaniards. A mission was located close to each presidio, and additional missions were founded in sites chosen for their arability and proximity to native populations who lived in communities called rancherias. The physical environment determined food gathering and production practices, tribal mobility, and type of housing. But despite these regional variations, the vernacular do California dwellings did share some features. Houses were domed, conical, or rectangular, built with wooden supports, and had roofs of brush and thatch, the most common being a type of grass called tulle. Today, we can find examples of this housing type in places like the Chumash Indian Museum in Thousand Oaks, California, where a replica Chumash village is set up. Or at Mission San Francisco de Asis, where the curators have installed a tool house to represent the dwelling of the Ilone people who made up most of its residents. The Indians who agreed to be baptized into the Catholic faith moved into the missions where they initially built houses in their traditional fashion. These rancherias were situated close to the main building cluster of church, missionary residence, and work-related space. As the mission expanded from a fledgling farm to a more prosperous operation, agriculture evolved from the improvisational to the permanent. None of the mission rancherias survive. In most sites, the church was the only structure left standing in the late 19th century. This one, at Mission San, oh, this one at Mission San Carlos Borromeo was the culmination of a building process which began from a wood and brush hut, then moved on to adobe and tile, and finally to the stone edifice, which, following ruin, was rebuilt and restored to the pristine version that is in the mission today. This trajectory is common to all the California mission churches. The underexamined story is the disappearance of what lay outside of the central mission space, which included the rancherias of the mission Indians. Historians have turned to early images to recapture lost spaces, but visual representations can also be instruments of erasure, as the next examples will demonstrate. The architectural development of Mission San Carlos Borromeo followed an established pattern. This excerpt from the diary of one of the missionaries describes the celebration of mass under a makeshift shed of branches called an enramada. Shortly after the ceremony, construction would begin in earnest. The first church at San Carlos was a wooden chapel. All the early buildings were of rough timber plastered with mud with flat roofs of clay and mud. By 1784, many structures, including the church, had been replaced with adobe walled versions. In 1786, the French explorer Jean-Francois de Gallop, the Count of La Perouse, traveled to Mission San Carlos, and his artist sketched the reception accorded them. La Perouse described the adobe church as, quote, neat but covered with thatch, unquote. Not seen in this image was the Indian rancheria, which La Perouse did describe. On the right stands an Indian village consisting of about 20 cabins, round six feet in diameter by four in height, some stakes of the size of an arm fixed in the earth and which approach each other in an arch at the top compose the timber work of it. Eight or 10 bundles of straw, very ill arranged over these stakes, defend the inhabitants well or ill from the rain and wind. These would have been the houses built by the Ohlone, Esalen, and Selinian people who lived at the San Carlos mission. An image from a later visit by another explorer, Alessandro Malaspina, provides a glimpse of the mission rancherias described by La Perouse. Malaspina's artist drew San Carlos from another angle, and here we can make out the group of structures that correspond to the count's description, and there's a closer look right there. In 1793, the British naval officer George Vancouver came to Mission San Carlos and saw the foundations for the present-day church being laid. This is a drawing by John Sykes, one of the people on the ship. Mm -hmm. The signs of construction are visible here and here, but notice in the background a group of round structures that match La Perouse's description of the Indian village. 
The new church at San Carlos was dedicated in 1797. The missionary report of 1806 mentioned the construction of 52 homes for the mission Indians, this time made of adobe with tile roofs. It is likely this group of buildings seen in a sketch from the voyage of the British geographer Frederick Beachy. The large majority of mission images are like this. They present still views of architecture and landscape. Human figures and activity are sparse. This foreground, foregrounding or centering of a church telegraphs the mission as a hegemonic Christian space and has obscured the cultural persistence of the Indian residents who always outnumbered the small contingent of priests and soldiers. The rancherias, often consigned to the periphery, are rendered mute. They were, in fact, eventful sites of the domestic routines and significant ritual moments which made up the lives of the vast majority of the mission population. Relevant contemporaneous textual sources can bring these neglected spaces into focus to recover an active Indian presence diminished by these pictures. And we'll look at three examples. Mission San Buenaventura was founded in Chumash territory, which also included the missions of Santa Barbara and Santa Ines. So at some point, its Indian residents started referring to themselves as Ventureños. Alfred Robinson, a high trader who traveled all over California in the early 19th century, published a book of his impressions, which included a drawing like this one. The church depicted here was de dedicated in 1809. On the left, we see a combination of the tool huts and adobe buildings that made up the Mission Rancheria for the Ventureño Chumash. This is a later drawing of the same mission by H.M.T. Powell, who was a gold prospector from the Midwest. He represented the rancheria as a row of buildings in the same location as Robinson's image. And here they are together for comparison. So what occurred in these rancherias? The ethnolinguist John P. Harrington interviewed Chumash Indians born during the Mexican period in California. They were still able to recount stories about mission life under the Franciscans as told to them by their elders. Harrington's chief source was Fernando Lebrado, an Indian born in Mission San Buenaventura around 1838. One of his more colorful accounts is of a dance performed by a Mission Indian woman named Encarnacion. Encarn quote, Encarnacion danced the seaweed dance in the adobe house in front of the mission one afternoon. This house was between the east and middle rows, while the west row bordered the garden wall. The old woman had a little hut south of these adobes, and she came from her hut all dressed up. She was naked except for her dancing skirt of feathers, end quote. Lebrado further recollects that, quote, there were also dances held at the house of Pellegrino, performed in a patio. The door of his house faced south, and the patio was a little to the east of the door, end quote. Pellegrino, for the record, was a Ventureño who taught school and was a mission singer. And I think it's just uh, striking that uh, Lebrado really remembers details of architecture. He also told John Harrington that when a couple got married, the Indians held a private wedding ritual in one of the adobe buildings prior to the Catholic ceremony. The celebration would again be accompanied with a particular dance. So hope you, hopefully you're catching on that dance was an essential part of worship and communal practice across all linguistic groups and tribalists in California. Dancers were seen as having supernatural powers because its performance was believed to produce knowledge and healing in the body. Mission San Luis Rey similarly began as a complex of wood and thatched structures when it was established in 1798. San Luis Rey had an auspicious start, quickly attracting a lot of Indians, many of them from the Quechnohichum, Ipai, Capeno, and Cahuila peoples who lived in the area. It became the richest and most agriculturally productive of the missions. So in 1802, a new adobe church with a tile roof was built. But soon after, the missionaries realized that they would need an even bigger one. And in 1815, a larger, grander edifice, the church that stands today, was inaugurated. In 1828, Auguste Duhot Sili, a businessman who commanded a French ship, visited San Luis Rey and drew this earliest known image of the mission. He wrote admiringly of the church architecture. Then he commented on the Indian housing. To the north, 200 paces from the mission, begins the rancheria, or village of the Indians. It is composed of thatched huts, merely, of various shapes, 
the larger number conical, scattered, or grouped without plan over a great extent of ground. Alfred Robinson was also at Mission San Luis Rey. His rendering similarly portrayed the Mission Church, but the rancheria is barely discernible on the right of edge of the frame. A comparison of the two images throws, throws their differences into relief. Duhot Sili literally foregrounds indigenous activity, while Robinson depicts a quiet, almost deserted scene. Perhaps it is because Duhot Sili visited the mission during the feast day of San Antonio de Padua and observed festivities which included native dances. His experience of the latter seemed to have made an impression on him because he wrote about the performance in great detail. Of the music, he wrote, quote, the harmony of the songs governing the time was at once plaintive and wild. It seemed rather to act upon the nerves than upon the mind, like the varied notes from an Aeolian harp during a hurricane." End quote. The only first-hand account of mission life from an Indian viewpoint was penned by Pablo Tuck, who was born at Mission San Luis Rey in 1820. He wrote about the daily routines of a family living in the Mission Rancheria, and made several references to dance, even including this drawing of Indian dancers. He explained the importance of dance to his culture and, in, and its endurance even while adopting a new religion. In Europe, they dance for joy, for a feast, for any fortunate news. But the Indians of California dance not only for a feast, but also before starting a war, for grief, because they have lost the victory, and in memory of grandparents, aunts and uncles, parents already dead. Now that we are Christians, we dance for ceremony. Mission San Gabriel, located 10 miles east of present-day Los Angeles, Richard showed a picture yesterday, was established in 1771. The Tongva, Serrano, and Cahuila peoples of Southern California made up most of its indigenous residents. Architectural development followed the same familiar pattern, rustic building being a prelude to more permanent construction. The current church was completed in 1805 and is at the center of the painting by the German naturalist Ferdinand Depp, who composed a rare period image that showcases the diversity of everyday life at the mission. The adobe church with its tile roof, distinctive for its Moorish lines and prominent buttresses, is the Christian symbol that dominates the built complex. In fact, if you look closely, Depp portrayed a religious procession just outside of it. Yet, if we direct our attention away from the center towards the secondary elements, we are reminded that for at least three generations of native Californians who lived at San Gabriel, there were spaces for their own meaningful practices, which may not have been perfectly aligned with the new cultural order. Within or in between the rows of adobe and tile-roofed buildings in the rancheria, it is not a stretch to imagine that dances and other ceremonies were performed. Furthermore, the tool house featured prominently in the foreground suggests that building materials and techniques existed on a spectrum and that pre-Spanish ways of living were not easily discarded. In fact, in 1785, the soldiers at Mission San Gabriel quashed a rebellion led, led by Nicolas Jose, a mission Indian who objected to the prohibition of performing dances in the rancheria. Jose wanted to hold a traditional mourning ceremony for his recently deceased son but the ban on dancing precluded this. In 1814, in a response to an administrative questionnaire about idolatry among indigenous peoples, the, missions, the missionaries responded thus, idolatry is still practiced by some Indians. It is being extirpated, however, by dint of effort. It would disappear all the faster if the old people and young ones did not live together, for the former are the ones who mislead the young. The rancherias were the social and private spaces of the Mission Indians. Here, they were able to dis observe indigenous practices which reconnected them with their pre-Spanish culture. Some, such as domestic cooking, social gathering, and game playing, represented a continuation of traditional life before the missions. Others, such as dances, had to be done in secret or under the watchful eye of the missionaries who were always on the lookout for performances they deemed obscene or idolatrous. A consideration of these structures, often consigned to the periphery of images, decentralizes the Christian narrative and recuperates an indigenous presence which has been marginalized. Looking outside the privileged center also reminds the architectural historian that while we tend to focus on formal 
qualities that align with canonical styles, the vernacular continues to exist and is a significant contributor to the built environment. Thank you, Richard. Postcolonial historians recommend reading against the grain to detect the silenced voices in the records produced by the colonizer. Similarly, looking against the grain can yield fresh perspectives about how power is negotiated in what Michel Foucault described as, quote, the micro-relations, the local interactions, and petty calculations of daily life, end quote. Period images, such as those we've just examined, have been used in diverse ways to aid restoration efforts, guide archaeological investigations, inform studies of stylistic exchange, and to help efforts at artistic attribution. We should also interrogate them, not just for what they show us, but what they don't. As we continue to adjust our historical lens, this offers a way out of the contextual framework that shaped their creation. Probing the literal margins of images can lead to a vision beyond the scene offered up for our consideration. Thank you. And, and I just wanted to add a postscript. Um, a couple of years ago, I was in Richard's office desperately trying to articulate a dissertation about California and not being able to get anything out besides an awkward, I like the churches. <laughs> and Richard looked at me and said, you know, there was more to the missions than the churches. Well, I know now, Richard. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Nanette. And we'll be taking questions after all the. Is this yours? Oh, oh. <laughs> after all the presenters have presented. Um, me. So, our next presenter is Dr. Sarah Driller. Sarah is a Chicago based architectural historian and digital humanist. I like that term, digital humanist. Uh, do you come up with that idea? No. Okay. Her current position as a postdoctoral researcher in the humanities is for the Society of Architectural Historians, which focuses on the SAH data project, which continues through December 2020. As a historian and educator, Sarah explores the connections between architecture and modernity since the industrial and scientific revolutions of the 18th century. Her next project will study Siegfried Gideon's appropriation of Einstein's theory of relativity for his book, Space, Time, and Architecture. Sarah's latest digital humanities project is called Contingent Talk, a limited run podcast series about precarious academic labor. I read that again. Precarious academic labor. That sounds like an oxymoron. Uh, and uh, she received her PhD from the University of Illinois in Chicago in 2015 and her Master's of Architectural History from UVA in 1999. Please welcome Sarah. I apologize for my voice. Can you all hear me okay? It's such an honor to be here. Thank you so much for selecting me and my project. And congratulations to Richard. Thank you for what you've done for me over the many years and for the profession. Some of you know I've been spending a lot of time lately thinking about the profession, and so I don't say that lightly. Thank you. My talk today is about the vanishing porch in perspective. 
an experiment in public scholarship that I launched in February 2018. The core of the Vanishing Porch Project is an interactive timeline that narrates the history of the Farnsworth House's screened porch through a series of primary documents that are not typically viewed together. In addition to the emphasis on storytelling through documentation, I was moved to speak about on this topic here because I have always felt especially inspired by Richard's contribution as a historian host on America's Castles. I was just starting an architectural history with Richard as my advisor around the time he was appearing on television, so it came at a particularly impressionable moment in my career. There are plenty of other reasons why I found what he was doing compelling, but in retrospect, I think that the fact that my family was impressed that I was at grad school studying with that fantastic historian from America's Castles really emphasized the power that being a publicly visible scholar could have on shaping widely held perceptions about architecture's role in society. This is going to be okay. I do want to add right up front that I do not think a digital storytelling uh, to project today is just the updated version of historians on television in the 1990s. The situation is more complex than that. My point here is only that for me and for my own sense of what constituted valid and impactful architectural history work, there is really no question that a fairly direct line exists from Richard's example 20 years ago to my own passion for mediated publicly visible scholarship today. Now, <clears throat> The Vanishing Porch is the second piece of the, of the Farnsworth House Reviewed, a series of architectural historical explorations I began a decade ago. It started with a peer-reviewed article, journal article that considers two aspects of the Farnsworth House's history that are rarely discussed, its expansive silk curtains, and its building, its life as a building known mostly through photographs, and then describes how they, in combination, impacted the evolution of the building's near sacred status as the embodiment of modern crystalline perfection. Since curtain walls, though, the Farnsworth House Reviewed has turned into the project I return to in between other projects uh, to challenge myself to think up different ways to approach a really iconic building. I've come up with countless, and I mean that countless, iterations, it's like a ticker tape in my back of my mind, on the theme of which only one and a half more pieces have made it into reality so far. The Vanishing Porch Interactive Timeline and a display of photographs I took during my curtain walls research in 2010 in which I restaged the curtain placement and shot angles in Hedrick Blessing's original 1951 photographs. Now, <clears throat> Unlike books or articles, the term interactive timeline has a pretty fluid definition. So I'm going to take a moment now to show you what the vanishing porch actually is uh, so that we have kind of a, a way to ground my comments uh, going forward. So let's see if this nifty thing works. Am I getting a... Here we go. The Vanishing Porch is a straightforward website that I designed and built myself with WordPress within the Humanities Commons Interdisciplinary Network. It has a very basic welcome page with the famous color sketch showing the porch with screening. The timeline itself is a series of slides, many of which have images of primary documents. The slides transition in a kind of smooth contemporary way when a visitor clicks the direction arrows on the left and right slides. Now along the bottom of the slide window is a number-based timeline, and each slide indicated as a flag. A visitor can use their mouse to grab anywhere on that timeline and move it separately, and then click on whatever slide flag they like. And this enables visitors to jump around in the story according to their own pace and interests. The slides include all the necessary credits, but I did 
provide a, a kind of read more uh, section underneath. I also created a static timeline page that presents the same content, but with the focus reversed so that the images are larger and the text is smaller. And this works better on some mobile devices and for people around the world who have lower bandwidth internet access. I've presented the timeline as an online companion to curtain walls. So the next tab over on the site is the article's introduction and a link to the Humanities Commons core repository landing page. The website also includes a relatively extensive about page where I've explained some of my web design decisions, such as the gray and white color scheme, the distinctive typefaces and credits for the typeface designers, the tool I used to build the timeline and credits to the group that designed that and so on. This page was part of my vision uh, for the project from the onset as a kind of service to people who might want to know what is involved in using digital methodologies to make history more accessible to the wider public. <clears throat> the Farnsworth House's screen porch was designed by Mies van der Rohe in 1946, installed by Chicago architect William Dunlap in 1952 and demolished by Peter Palumbo in the early 1970s. The screening itself was fine weave, corrosion resistant wire mesh cloth, a material typically reserved for maritime uses and carefully specified in this case because the building was going to sit just yards away from the banks of the Fox River. Mies also designed an elegant bronze framed door for the porch that pivoted on its center as, it, as visitors pushed inward at the top of the stairs. The building has no air conditioning, making the screen porch a crucial element of the building's overall architectural integrity because it, collect, it protected the client, Dr. Edith Farnsworth, from mosquitoes when she opened the main living spaces glass entry doors for much needed cross ventilation. One of the earliest design sketches attributed to Mies in the Museum of Art, Modern Arts collection illustrates an entry condition precisely as it ended up being constructed for the porch. A doorway with a prominent center vertical element that spans the entirety of a set of wide stairs. The Farnsworth House's screen porch is one of the most easily recognizable components of the schematic model that Mies's office prepared for his first solo exhibition at MoMA in 1947-48. His office used some sort of wire mesh here to ensure the porch's legibility, in fact. Although Mies was largely responsible for curating and designing his solo MoMA show himself, fellow modernist Philip Johnson coordinated the exhibition as the museum's representative. Through that connection, Johnson came to be quite familiar with the Farnsworth House's design and especially uh, became fixated on the building's glass walls. When Johnson built his own house with glass walls a few years later, the now famous Architectural Review article he wrote about his design inspiration ignored the Farnsworth House's screened porch. It just didn't fit into the narrative Johnson was engineering about himself, his own glass-focused architectural vision. Unlike Johnson's glass house, which progressed quickly without client and budgetary concerns, the Farnsworth House trajectory was fraught with problems. By late spring or early summer 1951, the friendship between Mies and Farnsworth officially ended. The situation had been disintegrating for some time, but there are especially bitter arguments over the type of curtains to install inside the inside of the glass walls was reportedly the final straw. And that, of course, that tension between architect and climate was the focus of my curtain walls article. On July 13, 1951, Mies filed suit against Farnsworth to recover the money that he believed she owed for the house's design and construction. Farnsworth's star as an unusually enlightened client fell far and fast, aided by Mies's many colleagues and supporters in the architecture world. 
It was within this context that Mies was offered the cover story for the House's special issue of Architectural Forum, the profession's most prestigious journal at the time. In addition to paying Hedrick Blessing to take the pictures, the publisher also arranged, offered to arrange the shoot directly with Farnsworth so that architect and client could avoid communicating about it. Mies would have been a fool to turn this opportunity down, and foolish he most certainly was not. In fact, the silk curtains Mies had fought so hard for were installed by the time the photographers arrived on site. Here. Oh, you can't see. Sorry, I'm... <clears throat> they were installed by the time the photographers arrived on site, which meant the screened porch was the only unfinished element of the design at that point. The screen porch, which was key to making the building livable for Mises' woman client, and had gone to the bottom, all the way to the bottom, of the to-do list when he filed a lawsuit against her that summer. The screen porch, which was made out of a mesh fabric that was semi-transparent in lived experience, but would have appeared in photographs as an opaque foil to the building's expanse of shimmering glass. The screen porch, which no one remembered or seemed to care about after more than a year of Philip Johnson's strategically glass-centric self-promotion. And so the architectural forum, House's special issue, ended up being delivered to 72,500 subscribers in early October 1951, which was thousands more than architectural record and progressive architecture that month combined. Assuming half those subscribers shared their copy with at least one colleague, the number of people who actually saw that issue and were introduced to the Farnsworth house through photographs missing the screen porch could have been upwards of 100 thousand individual readers. And since the building really couldn't be visited, and there were no new official photographs made for decades, this version of the Farnsworth House essentially became the Farnsworth House in the modern architectural imaginary. And the curtains bunched up in the corners like that, that's what I restaged in my 2010 visit, and that I hope to display at some point soon. <laughs> Now, by the end of that same month, October 1951, <clears throat> Farnsworth had filed a countersuit against Mies, claiming he had deceived her about the actual cost of the building's design and construction. This move brought considerable attention to the situation from the popular press and may have spurred on the infamous, infamously persistent, unfounded rumor that Farnsworth was Mies' jilted lover. Now, because of the Architectural Forum feature story, 1951 is always listed as the building's completion date. But the screened porch was not fully constructed until the following year. For that, Farnsworth hired William Dunlap, a young Chicago-based architect who also knew Mies. Evidence about this part of the story is limited, but it does appear likely that Mises' office had already assembled major sections of the porch off-site before the first lawsuit was filed in July 1951, making Dunlap's work in 1952 more about installation than design. And that's the center pivot bronze door at the top of the stairs and the Fox River in the, in the uh, background there. And so you're standing inside the porch looking out. Like Philip Johnson, Farnsworth's supporters also found that the best rhetorical strategy was treating the building as if it existed in real life the way it existed photographically. That is to say, emphasizing, emphasizing the building's glass walls and ignoring its screen porch. That was Elizabeth Gordon's approach in her famous House Beautiful article, The Threat to the Next America. 
Meanwhile, the legal problems between Meese and Farnsworth continued until June 1953, when Farnsworth was instructed to pay Meese about half of what he thought she owed. Now, for this project, I approximated the cost of the building, the final cost of the building, uh, using newspaper accounts of the financial details, and then adjusted that amount for inflation. And what I found is that Farnsworth total paid about $800,000 for her Plano vacation house. And that was roughly $413,000 more than she had originally inspect, expected. Now, looking back over the years that followed the lawsuits, it becomes clear that Mies had not only won in the courtroom, public opinion, or at least the world of architectural opinion, came down heavily in his favor as well. In an especially unapolog unapologetic attack on the screen porch and Farnsworth by extension, in 1961, James Marston Fitch declared, quote, The owner has made certain modifications which presumably make the house more comfortable to live in, but it cannot be held that they make it more pleasant to look at. In fact, in screening the porch, even with the care that was obviously exercised, Mises' beautiful creation has, not merely, has been not merely maimed but destroyed. Where once pure space flowed between and around, those hovering planes, there is now a solid black cube, heavy and inert. So the Farnsworth House had accumulated enough significance by the early 1970s for the Historic American Building Survey to undertake photo documentation. This is the only complete set of pictures ever made of the Farnsworth house that includes the screen porch. So we are fortunate that they show it so clearly, including the center pivot door. Importantly, although these photographs have existed as part of the public record for decades, they have only been easily viewable since the relatively recent advent of searchable online digitized collections. In other words, their creation was not connected to their circulation like the photographs Hedrick Blessing took for Architectural Forum magazine in 1951. And as a result, there was no corresponding impact on the porch's perceived value. The following year, Farnsworth sold the property to Peter Palumbo, a modern art connoisseur and collector. Palumbo immediately set about returning the Farnsworth house to what it looked like in the October 1951 photographs. Uh, by then, indisputably considered a faithful record of the original Mies design. Or, to put this another way, Palumbo systematically and purposefully removed physical evidence of the woman who had commissioned the house as a service to the legacy of modern architecture. Among other things, this meant dismantling the screen porch, a task that was undertaken with such thorough care that responses to my Curtain Walls article and the Vanishing Porch Timeline <clears throat> project very often expressed surprise that there was ever a screen porch there to begin with. Now, my Curtain Walls article continues the story, quite a bit actually, uh, <laughs> uh, of the house's photographic history with a special focus on MoMA's uh, Mies retrospective in 1985, since the planning for that exhibition included hiring Hedrick Blessing to make new photographs of the Farnsworth house. But it was important to me that the Vanishing Porch timeline uh, come to sort of a, an abrupt end here as a way to emphasize the finality of the porch's demolition. Now, I made other curatorial choices uh, with Vanishing Porch too, some of which I want to acknowledge openly because they each connect to a project goal. One is that I tried not to romanticize the porch it was functionally important and had some handsome detailing, a fact that even James Marston Fitch could not ignore. But when asked, I am actually on record as having said that I do not think the porch should be rebuilt, and I don't want anyone to presume otherwise. In fact, one of the points of this project is to emphasize that the demolition of the porch is part of the house's history that is significant in its own right. Now, another choice I made about the timeline was to avoid theoretical argumentation, at least in an overt sense. And you can get that from curtain walls. Uh, just playing of it in there. 
if you want, <laughs> but for this project, it is supposed to be storytelling and that is informed by scholarship and directed toward an educated public audience. Now, how we define the public in digital humanities is an ongoing and multi-layered conversation. If anyone wants to have that conversation with me, I'm always available. For the Vanishing Porch audience specifically, I imagined the contemporary version of the kinds of people that might have watched America's Castles in the 1990s. So, for instance, my best friend, an extremely articulate specialty pharmacist who relies on travel and the arts to balance the rational urgency of her STEM career, or a close friend of my family, a retired social worker who attends book fairs and film festivals as a hobby, and so on. From a methodological perspective, I hope Vanishing Porch demonstrates, as I think America's Castles did, that with some creativity, history can be made more accessible, more authentically public, without stripping away its complexities. Why did I choose an interactive timeline for Vanishing Porch as opposed to some other modality? Well, if you've read Curtain Walls, you'll know that the narrative there has a kind of spiral shape. It was not my intention to do that. It just evolved as I wrote it into the kind of story that moves forward in time and then doubles back on itself a little and then moves forward a bit more and so on. And while I understood that that made sense for that context, frankly, it bothered me. Uh, after the article was published, I wanted to revisit the material in a different way to see if I could make the hard choices that would straighten things out a little. In this particular form, the interactive timeline seemed like a way to create a more linear narrative while also giving the audience a chance to spiralize it for themselves, if that makes the most sense to them. This is actually my favorite photo of the house or one of them anyway. And I want to end by reflecting on the timing of the timeline. The fact that I launched it in February 2018, but that I worked on it, uh, this in earnest, during the second half of 2017 in particular. Now, some of you may remember what was happening in late 2017. <clears throat> and you may be wondering if there's any connection between the Me Too times of zeitgeist of that moment and my decision to tell the story of an aspect of Mises' design for this house that was directly associated with, with his woman client and then ignored, marginalized, attacked, and eventually literally removed, removed from the building. And the answer is yes, emphatically yes. I had been playing around with a few different ideas for how to extend curtain walls for more than a year by the time the Harvey Weinstein story broke but for the specifically woman-centric social justice quality of the porch story <clears throat> moved me to action in this particular case. I would not recommend making every research decision based on current events, especially rage-inducing ones, <laughs> especially. But this worked for me in that moment. And from what I have been told, it is part of what my audience continues to find compelling about the Vanishing Porch Project today. Thank you. I'll leave that image up for a couple minutes. Our last presenter is Richard Chinoweth, who is uh, an AIA member. Richard is visiting professor at Mississippi State through uh, next year, where he teaches architectural history as well as a design studio. And he didn't even mention his uh, talents as an amazing artist, digital artist. Um, but he's had three fellowships from the U.S. Capitol Historical Society in support of his architectural research on the lost and unbuilt work of Latrobe on the U.S. Capitol. This research is ongoing, and uh, five chapters are either completed or underway in his publication. The synthesis of this research results in very detailed three-dimensional models which describe the complex story of the Capitol's design and its construction, from landscape all the way to sculpture in the building, and which can be illuminated using real-world lighting and image-based lighting techniques that you'll 
shortly see. Some of these images were used on a CBS Sunday morning segment with Charles Osgood. So please welcome Richard Chinowit. Okay, um, thank you very much, Travis. I appreciate it. It's an honor to be presenting today um, for Richard Guy Wilson's legacy. When I was at, I was at UVA, it was, for, it was for a Master of Architecture. I focused on architectural history um, a great deal and considered uh, Richard a mentor of sorts in that uh, regard, although I was very busy in the studio. I always tried to bring something new to a paper and uh, I think I got a laugh from Richard once when I evoked Evelyn Waugh in uh, Evelyn Waugh's fictional Le Corbusier character in a critical paper. And once I got a wow <laughs> when I came up with original blueprints for Futurama, 1939 building at the World's Fair. In his notes on that paper, however, Richard encouraged me to dig deeper and find more contradictions. And that was a really great lesson for me uh, to, to take away, and it's really at the core of any complex history. So in honor of digging deeper, I will begin. Uh, introduction. Between 1803 and 1809, President Thomas Jefferson and his surveyor of public buildings Benjamin Henry Latrobe collaborated with unique synergy and sympathy to complete the construction of the U.S. Capitol. In fact, their association would be without parallel in the history of the construction of the Capitol. I use the term collaborated loosely. Their relationship, in a broad sense, was traditional, an architect working for a client. After 1801, it was Jefferson whose approval and approbation Latrobe needed, both officially and psychically. He proudly embraced his role and his title and, sig and signified it with great flamboyance, as we see here. At the beginning of Jefferson's tenure, the inchoate nation was struggling to establish itself. L'Enfant's plan for Washington, a grid crossed by grand intersecting avenues, was mostly forests and fields. The soul of L'Enfant's plan, however, was that it symbolically represented the structure of the new government. The Capitol building was key to the plan taking the loftiest position. At the very outset, the project was a source of high drama among gigantic personalities. From the laying of its cornerstone in 1793, the Capitol's construction <clears throat> embodied conflicting interests, competing aesthetics, jealousy, calumny, intrigue, bad press, and leaking roofs. <laughs> Squabbles ensued between professional architects, amateurs, commissioners, and contractors. Essentially, it was a unique situation in world history in which a seat of government was emerging from the landscape at the same time a new form of government was being formed within. Latrobe continued to design and build the capital well into the Madison ad administration, a period known as Latrobe's first building campaign. It didn't last long. British troops invaded the city of Washington in August 1814 and burned the public buildings including the capital. The Hall of Representatives in the South Wing, which Jefferson had speculated might be the handsomest room in the world, was gutted. Latrobe's rich neoclassical interiors were destroyed, and the nation's first Statue of Liberty, which pr had presided over the entrance, was reduced to lime. The Enigma. Under the auspices of the Gabriel Prize, I spent a summer in Paris studying sem several of Thomas Jefferson's favorite buildings in an attempt to understand him better. My research led to the Allo Blay, the grain market, and then to the story of the Capitol. I was transfixed by this enigma of the most beautiful room, but was frustrated by the lack of visual evidence. How is it that no artist paused to record the scene? Not even Latrobe himself, a, pro a prolific sketcher. How could this American treasure be pieced back together so we can see it? 
Uh, what can we learn about the design and construction of the Capitol by recreating it? Whose ideas were better regarding the lighting of the chamber? How could I recreate this American masterpiece? Clues do exist. There are roughly 20 construction documents and renderings in the Library of Congress, most being of small scale, uh, scores of letters between the principals, and a few surviving parts of the building. I resolved to forensically piece this period of the Capitol together using digital methods in an effort to answer my own questions and to clarify and illustrate uh, Jefferson's and Latrobe's complicated dialectic. Latrobe himself wrote, quote, to give an adequate description of a building unaccompanied by drawings is always a vain attempt, close quote. During my investigation, I discovered many disparate sources of information between drawings and letters, scores of change orders occurring in letters, very interesting how informal the change orders were, clues from topographical sketches, and many discrepancies. In the end, I believe my computer model accurately represents the state of the design in 1814, and it can be digitally tested. Background. By 1801, the year Thomas Jefferson was inaugurated as president, the United States Capitol had been the most ambitious building program on the continent for nearly eight years. A great deal was invested in the building. Besides being a physical seat for the legislature, the Capitol was to be a symbol for the new nation. In 1785, Jefferson had modeled Virginia's capital on the Maison Carré for the same reason, that the noble beauty of the Roman temple would be suggestive of the timeless and noble future for America. Latrobe also understood the capital's symbolic importance. Plus, he brought to bear his unique professional experience. This razor's edge of classical timelessness and modern construction was something which Jefferson and Latrobe could agree upon as the touchstone for a national image. In 1783, in 1793, excuse me, amateur architect William Thornton was declared the winner of the competition for the Capitol, and Stephen Hallett was declared the runner-up. Thornton's scheme lacked a structural strategy, however, and in the years that followed, few ideas for the Capitol went unchallenged. Oh, it plays automatically. This sets the stage for us. This is where we are in 1801. And the state of affairs in 1801, when Jefferson's inaugurated, So we dissolved to the famous Birch drawing in the Library of Congress. By 1801, rutted and muddy Jenkins Hill featured a north wing of questionable construction. Both houses of Congress met there. By, in 1803, the House of Representatives was moved to a temporary structure at the south wing where it would eventually belong. The result, oops, did I miss something? Yep. They were, um, they're, they're moving the, the, hall, uh, the House of Representatives to the south wing where it eventually would belong. The result was the bake oven, a three-dimensional extrusion of Thornton's ill-conceived elliptical chamber for which a foundation had been laid. The bake oven was roofed, fenestrated, and connected to the north wing by a covered gangway. Optimists maintained that the rest of Thornton's south wing would somehow rise above this odd chamber. But after 10 years of construction under five architects, the works were already woefully off schedule. President Jefferson appointed Latrobe the surveyor of public buildings in 1803. He was impressed by Latrobe's plan, plans for the Washington Navy Yard and his successes in Philadelphia. Jefferson's keen hope was that the sui generis Latrobe a professional architect and engineer would be able to complete the capital. Conversely, Latrobe knew of Jefferson's fame and reputation and held him in very high esteem as, quote, the planter of arts in America. They each likely knew that their fortunes would somehow be entwined, and each likely did not know that their strong opinions would put them at odds. Latrobe's architecture. 
Upon taking charge of the Capitol's construction, Qu Latrobe quickly found fault with Thornton's troubled plans, a concoction of figural rooms that were not organically unified by a structural system. Latrobe's architecture, by contrast, was rationally organized by a structural system. A believer in the strength and simplicity of forms and volumes, Latrobe's architecture relied on determinate light or unified light. We'll see an image of that in a little bit. The idea was that solid and projected architectural masonry forms appear more distinct and more clear when presented in this unified light. Latrobe shunned superficial de decoration, preferring that elegant surfaces and volumes be the strength of his architecture. In 1807, Latrobe wrote to Jefferson, it is not the ornament, it is the use that I want. His strong volumetric forms, use of lighting, reduction of ornament, and modernization of building systems essentially established Latrobe as an architect of the Enlightenment. But he also describes himself as a quote-unquote bigoted Greek. He borrowed heavily from Stuart and Rivette's Antiquities of Athens, a copy of which was available to him at the Library Company of Philadelphia. His use of Greek moldings was more conducive to invention and played a role in the creation of light and shadow in his interior arrangements. So uh, please note the south wing here on uh, screen, screen left for you. And you can see uh, Thornton's elliptical chamber is somewhat diagrammatic. Um, as a result of the conference plan and the competition. And this is what Latrobe came up with for his ground floor. A little bit, a little bit more involved. Um, <laughs> the redesign of the South Wing. Latrobe recommended that the crude, crude elliptical bake oven and its foundation be removed. It made no sense to Latrobe that Thornton's elliptical legislative chamber was on the ground level. By March 1804, Latrobe speedily devised new South Wing plans and sections and presented them to the president. He placed the legislative chamber 20 feet above the entry level on a piano nobile. He altered the shape of the room from an ellipse to a hippodrome. The hippodrome consisted of a wide band running north-south abutted by two semicircular pieces to the east and to the west. Carving and tablature on the ellipse would require half of the blocks to be unique semicircular geometry would be much more forgiving. At the entry level, he created an intricate program of support offices, spiral stairs within the poche, privies, a courtyard, lobbies leading to the public galleries. Whether that led to the word lobby, as in lobbyist, I'm not quite sure, but it, it may. And a sequence that included a spectacular skylit vestibule. The president was not happy. The approved plans had been fundamentally changed. Jefferson wrote to Latrobe, nothing impedes progress so much as perpetual changes of design. <laughs> but Latrobe's drawings were so convincing, the president did agree to the changes and pleaded with him to make haste with construction. Latrobe's 1806 plan, the lighting of the chamber. A principal focus of my investigation was the lighting of the south wing. The president and his architect had different ideas about how to light this chamber. Using digital lighting techniques, I have simulated light levels and light diffusion to illustrate the two concepts. Uh, uh, Latrobe's famous um, section that shows, uh, I think you can see the dotted lines indicating um, the limits of um, the sun rays coming in on the, uh, the, the east-west section. And note the liberty there. In real life, that liberty is about this big. And um, that's the subject of my next paper, um, the uh, creation of that liberty. The 108-foot the foot by 84-foot block of the south wing began to rise from new foundations. The internal structural arrangement of 24 columns included a beveled seat on top of the entablature for the spring of the roof framing. What would be the nature of this roof? In August 1786, 43-year-old widower Thomas Jefferson was introduced to Londoners Richard and Maria Causeway by his compatriot Tr John Trumbull, then living in London. At their initial meeting in the Paris Grain Market, 
Jefferson seemed particularly smitten by Maria Cosway, a 26-year-old Italian-English artist. <coughs> Marichelle's drawing of the grain market. Over the course of the next six weeks, Jefferson and his new friends engaged in a whirlwind of activities in and around Paris. As might be expected, the venues were architectural and intellectual in nature. When the Cosways left for London, Jefferson seemingly fell into a depression. It was then he wrote his famous head and heart letter to Maria Cosway, dated 12 October 1786. In the letter, he discusses their companionship, their contrasting cultures, their wonderment of the sights in and around Paris, all in his charming self-effacing style and all reflected by the dichotomy of his rational and his emotional minds. Specifically, with regard to our interest in the capital, he describes in the letter his first meeting with the Causeways at the Allobe, and I quote, oh, exclamation point, it was the most superb thing on earth, exclamation point, close quote. But Sly Jefferson, writing in dialogue, actually makes two claims in the same paragraph. His head claims the most superb thing on earth is the architecture the sticks and chips of the aloe blé, while simultaneously his heart claims the most superb thing on earth is the visage of his companions, to wit, Maria Cosway. Clearly, there was both a romantic vision and a romantic memory at work in Jefferson's imagination 20 years later, when in 1804, he asked Latrobe to put a glass roof over the hall in the south wing. The ecstatic memory of dazzling light obviously mixed with the melancholic memory of a young woman most likely he loved, perhaps were inextricable. In any case, Jefferson's memory now became Latrobe's mandate. This is, uh, I started with uh, a recreation of the Aloe Blay. Oh. <clears throat> the Aloe Blay, now the site of the Bourse, was a donut-shaped building built for light and air quality. It was one of the most foremost modern industrial buildings in all of Europe and had very recently been fitted with a glass roof by Legrand and Molinos. One can imagine direct light streaming through patterns of glass and clouds of grain dust illuminating the bustling interior warehouse floor. How could the fractured light of a granary suit the solemn proceedings of a Congress of Legislators? Latrobe struggled with this charge. Privately, he complained of the President's reliance on old French books. Philosophically, he disagreed with the idea. A legislative chamber should not be illuminated by constantly changing direct sunlight. Graciously taking his stand, he wrote to Jefferson, quote, <coughs> so spangled a ceiling giving an air of the highest gaiety will, I think, destroy the solemnity that is appropriate to the object of the edifice, close quote. And, quote, as all the architecture in the hall is solid and projected, its whole effect will be lost by the destruction of determinate shadows on which it depends." Close quote. Going head to head with his determined client did not go well. Over the course of months, Latrobe tried two things to bolster his position. He, number one, he reinforced his position um, on technical grounds claiming that through direct leakage and condensation, the hall would be subject to constant dripping. He then, number two, tried to convince the president that a more appropriate turn would be to employ a lantern or light monitor of fixed vertical panes of glass, which would be far, a far better solution suited to the seriousness of the business and would be less susceptible to leakage. The president was not seduced by any of Latrobe's arguments, either the ones based on philosophical notions or the ones based on technical difficulty. A stickler for the rules of classical architecture, Jefferson pointed out that there was no precedent for a lantern. Finally, Jefferson wrote to the architect in September 1805, suggesting the final decision was Latrobe's, but he made his own point quite clear, quote, I cannot express to you the regret I feel on the subject of renouncing the aloe blay lights in the Capitol Dome. That single circumstance was to constitute the distinguishing merit of the room and solely would have made it the handsomest room in the world without a single exception, close quote. In this standoff between the client and the architect, it was Latrobe who blinked. By November 1805, the prolific Latrobe had designed a beautiful sheet for a wood-framed roof with 100 skylights in 20 radial bands. It was not a replication of the aloe blay, 
as each light in this roof was contained within a framed light box, the thickness of the roof was minimal to maximize the illuminative effect, and it was based on the Philibert uh, Delorme detail that they both were uh, knowledgeable of. Latrobe, ever hopeful, however, accommodated a lantern within the structural framing of the roof. In a sense, he built a knockout plug for later use, <laughs> just in case the skylights didn't work out. And here's Jefferson uh, coming down to the Capitol in the late fall of 1806, and he's not pleased. Jeff uh, Latrobe is out of town, and he upgrades the clerk of the works, John Lenthal, and you can see the knockout plug for the lantern up there, which he took note of. Late in 1806, when the glass for the roof had been ordered, Latrobe produced an exquisite watercolor of the entire edifice, depicting a completed capital which, with matching lanterns on the north and south wings, dedicating the drawing to his esteemed client, whose favor and approval he desperately sought. The drawing was a last hour appeal by the eternally optimistic Latrobe. So right up to the very end, he's trying to change the president's mind. Getting ready for the Congress. The colossal sitting liberty designed by Latrobe and carved by Giuseppe Franzoni was unveiled in September 1807. Visitors would enter the room from the dark compressed space of the stair enclosure and step into the great light filled chamber facing the liberty. That same month, upholstery and drapes were ordered. Platforming was built and carpeted. Specifications were sent out to bid for mahogany desks and chairs and argon lamps and chandeliers were purchased. The, gl the glass roof so desired by the president was in place, and in the late summer of 1808, George Bridport of Philadelphia finished his spectacular faux painted ceiling. Conclusion, Jefferson had speculated that the chamber would be the handsomest room in the world. Latrobe declared in his report to Congress, quote, it will be the most spe splendid legislative hall that has ever been erected. This interior was destroyed, however, and this chapter of history has been lost to time. To me, it was an opportunity to thoroughly investigate an architectural history using digital and visual methods. The problems, the solutions, the conflicts of the story were hyperbolic, visual, deeply rooted in the psyche, and could not be fully understood through letters and drawings. Jefferson and Latrobe were, in fact, on the same team, but the subtleties and the nuances of their design differences seemed great. By using various digital methods, I was able to bring together every discernible fact, dimension, detail, and change order concerning the work. By doing this, I attempted to elucidate a difficult story and allow the viewer to decide. My goal was to bring the chamber to its full glory and allow visitors to see for themselves what Latrobe's grandson recalled in a speech to the AIA in 1881, quote, I can still recall among the shadowy impressions of my earliest boyhood, the effect approaching awe produced upon me by the old Hall of Representatives, there can be no question that the hall was a noble room. Even the British officer who was ordered to destroy it is reported to have said, as he stood at the entrance, that it was a pity to burn anything so beautiful. So, let's see if I can make that go. I'll run through a few stills and animations for you. I can barely hear the sound. It's Quiet City by Aaron Copeland. I happened to be in the Library of Congress the day that uh, Ford Petrus acquired that drawing and he was he was kind of over the moon about that. <laughs> View from the northeast at higher resolution. Here is a the high view of Jefferson's vision as built and as destroyed in 1814 and we see the 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 20 uh, bands of five skylights, uh, that is 100 skylights in radial bands. And I think you can see here the, the, the centerpiece to the hippodrome, and this would, be, um, this would be looking to the west. 
hemisphere. And if you, if you note right up in here, you'll see right up in this cubic centerpiece, you'll see really how different the, the, uh, the unified light is that Latrobe talks about. It's, the lighting program really kind of drew that out. It's quite distinct and different. Okay, Jefferson's vision on the, on the equinox. Jefferson gets fiddle music. <laughs> and Latrobe's vision. He gets the requiem. <laughs> so this light that does enter is because there is light coming from the western, uh, south and the western windows. The view upon entry uh, showing the 10 foot tall Miss Liberty that was destroyed. It was, it was carved in plaster. It, it never made it to Vermont marble. And view from the northeast showing Miss Liberty and a quick, a coda. At the same time I was studying Jefferson's magnificent obsession I also happened to submit a design to a national composition to a national competition for the Washington D.C. Metro Canopy Program, and we won the competition, and and it's still going on today. In fact, and it's uh, one of the truly fascinating aspects of architectural history is how ideas travel across continents and across time. And I'm so I am here to say that this is. Technically, it's Jeffersonian, <laughs> with a, a little bit of John Stone thrown in there, the John Stone's dining room. Thank you. That's it. Okay, I guess we need the lights. Okay, we have uh, a little over five minutes for questions for any of our four speakers. Then we're going to take a break at 11 and then uh, be back here by 11.20. So, questions? Yes, please use the microphone so we can hear the questions. I'd like to hear more from Richard about uh, the software that he employed. The software, what, what is the software you used? Okay. Um, I, I used a modeler called Form Z, and uh, I used an animation system called Electric Image, and of course, Photoshop, and um, I used another sub, subdivision modeler, uh, but uh, I, I don't think of the software as um, being that important, I think it's kind of like uh, reaching into your toolbox and deciding to use the hammer with the wooden handle or do I use the, ha <laughs> the hammer with the fiberglass handle today. Um, I think of it kind of like that. So, But those were the two main ones. Yeah, there's a question right here. This is a fascinating subject that I have keen interest in. Uh, I'm curious to know why you did not interpret the the, the dome of this space uh, with the skylighted louvers that were part of that discussion between Latrobe and Jefferson, how that would have imaged in this situation. You, you're showing the light, but how about when the, the louvers are in place? The, yeah, the, the story w it was very uh, complicated, and I, and I just wanted to go with um, 
the I, that could possibly be another chapter as I as I move on with all of this. Uh, I also um, I had to make decisions about whether to show um, scaffolding and all the construction <laughs> stuff. So I, I kind of had to make a um, some decisions about w where to stop and where to show it. And at a certain point, it, it becomes um, kind of an ideal design. Technically, when the when the capital was burned, I, I think there may have been a couple of column capitals that hadn't been carved yet, um, and certainly there would have been construction equipment all over the place. So. There's a question right here. Yeah. <coughs> My question is for Nanette. Um, I'd like to know about the word rancherias. Um, it sounds Spanish to me, and what did the natives call their villages? Or is a rancheria signifying that those people are Christians and, and they're living there because they are? Well, as far as, as rancheria is a Spanish word, and it was the word that the, mission, the Spaniards used um, to refer to wherever the uh, indigenous people were living. So when they were scoping out sites for a mission, they said, where are the rancherias? Because Junipero Serra really wanted to be close to the population. Now, most, so it started out as you know, communities where they were, but when they were moved to the mission, then their village was called the rancheria. Now, the uh, indigenous people had different names in their own language. Um, a lot of times I find that they refer to the name of the land or they refer to, there's a lot of um, conflation between what they call themselves between the land or what their language is. Because mm -hmm. their, their identity is sort of this intersection of where they live and the language they speak. So yeah. it's the, you know, the culture area and the linguistic tribe. So it varies. Um, yeah, rancheria, is, it, it's really a Spanish term to sort of generalize everything. But yeah. I, I started fifth grade at the Italian Little Flower, which was the school that was next to Samuel Ray. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I remember it from fifth grade. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, question right back there. And we've got another question. A question for Mr. Chenoweth. Uh, fascinating digital images. They really are remarkable. I'm curious about what order actually ended up in the room because I, I re didn't do a trove at first, do a version with Doric, and then it went to Tower of the Winds, and then you're showing a Corinthian order, which looks like a Greek Corinthian order. Is that what was actually put in the room? Th that's correct, Calder. Um, it was Jefferson who initially wanted the Doric, mm -hmm. and I, I couldn't get into this in, the, in this short paper because it would have gone over <laughs> way, way over, but there, there, was a, there was a whole other argument about that. And Latrobe talked him off the ledge, yeah, and exactly. uh, <laughs> by by proving that you couldn't achieve square metopes, and then he kind of so by painting Jefferson into a box, Jefferson had to give up on that. Um, Latrobe did use um, the Tower of the Winds in the vestibule to the house, and which was not part of the original entry sequence, but. When, when Bullfinch came around, uh, that vestibule did become part of the entry sequence. So that was Tower of the Winds. But wasn't this one of the drawings showing Tower of the Winds in this room? In the, in the, uh, I thought a Latrobe drawing showed this. Uh, yeah, uh, th this. What Latrobe pushed for very strongly was this, um, the monument of Lysicrates, yeah. the, this, this Greek Corinthian, which is right here. Um, whether or not there was, a, I, I, I don't recall off the top of my head if there's a if there's an actual drawing that shows Latrobe um, thinking about maybe the Tower of the Winds, but he did do the Tower of the Winds in the vestibule, which is um, just north. It's literally the the a few steps north of this chamber. Okay, thank you. Sir. You're welcome. Probably have uh, time for one more question. Down here in the front. Uh, yeah. I, th 
a question for Nanette, but first an observation. Um, I love the juxtaposition of, of Sarah and Joe's presentations and the messiness that humans bring to trying to live in idealized environments. Um, mosquitoes for Miss Farnsworth and almost immediately uh, smoke houses and kitchens and livestock in the gardens behind uh, the pavilions and, and ranges. Um, but for Nanette, yeah, clearly we all recognize the European structure behind the orderly uh, architecture that we saw. But the, for the Indians, um, what looks like disorder to us, I'm sure there's m amazing structure behind uh, their uh, residences, their, their uh, buildings. Did you get it? Did, was there enough left to really understand what that structure uh, was? Um. No, there wasn't. Most of the information about what their structures are come from ethnographic, uh, you know, rather than, well, I guess archaeological um, excavation also. A lot of their shapes are circular, whether it's their sacred shape or it's their dwelling. Um, yeah, so they, they weren't, it, it, that, yeah, the Europeans just thought, well, what is this hap haphazard arrangement of stuff here and there? Um, but it, it, a lot of their shapes were circular. Um, but also, a lot of their structures were improvisational. They, they were there for the moment. So I think there wasn't really a lot of thought to something permanent. So um, sacred spaces, dwellings uh, would be erected. And then you know, when there were too many fleas or they just weather, they, they would just be burned down and made again. So, uh, so yeah, that, that, that definitely is e everywhere. The, the visitors say, w w why is it so? disorganized when I, yeah, I'm sure it wasn't that way um, to the Indians. Okay, um, that's probably all we have time for. It's 11 o'clock, so let's take a 20-minute break. And, uh,